Welcome to the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. I'm Peter King. I'm going to be joined by Miles Simmons, my friend from NBC. And we're also going to be joined later in the podcast this week by two-time Super Bowl winning coach Tom Coughlin, who joined me for an extended discussion. I get a little wordy on these things. I say, hey, Tom, we're going to do this for 20 minutes. And then 40 minutes later, I said, hey, sorry, kept you too long. But the discussion was really, really interesting. He's got a new book out. Uh, about uh, the greatest upset of his career and one of the great upsets in NFL history when the Giants beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl 15 years ago and knocked them from the ranks of the 72 Dolphins, which is to say Patriots weren't undefeated anymore. Anyway, Miles, welcome to another week of a rollicking good time on the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce I'm going to start by just asking you, I want your one big takeaway from this weekend of NFL football, from week 13 of the NFL, which was, had some interesting moments and some kind of gutting moments, just as Mark Ingram on Monday night, and also uh, some nonsensical moments like Indianapolis playing on Sunday night football. Give me your big takeaway from this weekend. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase Dick Vermeil and I'll say that I think the 49ers can rally around Brock Purdy and play good football. And I know that it's going to be tough. You're talking about a seventh round pick, Mr. Irrelevant, as he is known for being the last pick of the draft. But when the 49ers are now down to their third string quarterback, it looks like he can go in there and function within the offense and perhaps keep the San Francisco 49ers as Super Bowl contenders. Good one. Very good one. Um, I want to just sort of introduce what we're going to be doing in this week's pod. Uh, Let's go over the topics and then we will begin. Uh, I, I debated this a lot over what to put in the topics this week because there's about 20 to me that have some interest but let's run them down number one brady does it again but are the bucks any good number two uh the Bengals are sort of the kings of narrow wins over good teams number three the muddled mvp race which is really gotten very very interesting in the last two weeks brock purdy is suddenly very important He's not irrelevant. No matter what, who is the, the, the guy from whatever, Laguna Beach, California, unfortunately, he just died this past year. But the mystery irrelevant guy, uh, all of a sudden, Brock Purdy is really very relevant. Yeah. Uh, Miami really looks headed for the wild card round right now. Based on the schedules, based on where they are, uh, and we'll discuss where Miami is right now after kind of a lousy game for them in Santa Clara on Sunday. The two Souths, the AFC and NFC, the brethren Souths, they stink. And (laughs) I I wouldn't be shocked if both divisions were one and done in the playoffs with their one representative this year. So we've also entered weird nation miles because the Detroit Lions are favored as of this moment, over the Minnesota Vikings on Sunday, even though the Vikings are 10-2, and two, and even though the Lions are the Lions. But then again, maybe they're not the Lions anymore. We'll discuss. I'm going to ask Miles what the Rams could and should do right now as they sit here in the last month of a very lost season. And finally, we're going to talk about Deion Sanders. We're going to morph into... Pete Thamelville, and we're going to talk about college football for a few minutes with Deion Sanders going to Colorado, which has really created quite a stir uh, in the football and, quite honestly, in the black community as well. And we'll discuss that and talk about Deion's uh, future, which I think is totally, absolutely fascinating. So, Miles. Let's start with the most recent event, which is Tampa Bay 
winning on Monday night by the skin of Tom Brady's beautifully white, beautiful white teeth. And uh, uh, you think he's had some work done to those teeth? Uh, but anyway, let's talk about uh, about what happened. And I have to tell you, I'll confess, I've just seen the highlights because I was asleep by midway through the first quarter. Uh, both, uh, you know, Sunday night being very late and then traveling west to east uh, on Monday during the day. I, I had a bit of a long winter's nap last night. So I missed most of this game. But I'm going to ask you to tell me exactly what it means and how in the world Tampa Bay did this. Well, look, you didn't miss much, you know. I mean, the last three minutes of the fourth quarter were basically the entire game. I mean, from Mark Ingram stepping out of bounds inexplicably in order to bring up third and one, and then why in the world are they running a pass play on third and one in the New Orleans Saints? I don't quite know, but they did. They didn't get it. They don't get the first down. They have to punt. And then it's Tom Brady time. And how many times have we seen this in the fourth quarter where Tom Brady has his back 44 against the wall? 44 to be exact. Yes, exactly. I know. They did show the stat last night, didn't they? So it, it's just one of those things where once you give Tom Brady the ball back like that, it starts to feel inevitable. And it was, you know, it was just one of those things where even the left tackle holding on a play where they had a touchdown with about what 15 seconds left that couldn't stop Tom Brady from doing the Tom Brady thing and throwing the touchdown with three seconds left so this is just what happens and if you have the opportunity to crush Tom Brady you have to do it you can't just let him get back into the game because I mean at points in the fourth quarter when the Buccaneers, they're punting, Tom Brady looks like he wants to go for it on fourth and 10 in minus territory. And then Todd Bowles ends up saying no, send the punt team out. It ends up being the right decision because, well, the Saints don't execute, right? So, and that gives Tom Brady the opportunity to go down the field and win it two times. So yeah, it was just, it was one of those games where Tom Brady is still Tom Brady. And if you don't crush Tom Brady's team when you have the chance, then that's what's going to happen to you. The Rams saw it a few weeks ago, and now the Saints have seen it, and now the Buccaneers have the inside track to being the division winner of the NFC South. So there are two things looking back on this game that I did not watch, but I watched those extended uh, NFL highlights on YouTube, whatever, 11, 12 minutes. And was one is... You know, you talk about Brady not being happy with with punting, but hey, Miles, first play of the fourth quarter, Tampa Bay is down 13 to three. The Bucks have a fourth and seven mm -hmm. at the New Orleans 40. At the New Orleans 40. Yep. And Todd Bowles punts. I mean, that was utterly, to me, preposterous. And yeah. add to the fact that Jake Kamara, who's had a great rookie year for Tampa, punted the ball in the end zone. Yep. Net plus 20 yards. I mean, I just... It's the second time that's happened I, in the last you know, few weeks, look, too. It's, which is just... I mean... It's like, well, how do you not learn... You got Tom here? Brady as your quarterback. Even though he's having a bad day, or the offense is having a bad day, however you'd, you'd term it, I mean... Fourth and seven, you're down two scores in the fourth quarter. I mean, come on. That's, yeah. I thought that call was utterly preposterous. Okay. Yeah. So the one other thing that was very, very interesting to me. Okay. So like, you know, we talk about what happened with, uh, you know, with, with Mark Ingram and stepping out of bounds right before he, uh, you know, he basically was maybe could not have made the first down by putting his, uh, <clears throat> you know, by putting his nose in the in the defender and and going for it. <clears throat> but I was hugely impressed for those who don't know. OK, so New Orleans is up 16 to three. There's about five and a half minutes to go. And there's actually six minutes to go. <clears throat> And Dalton throws a little swing pass out to Mark Ingram. And he catches it. 
and he runs out of bounds at the Bucks 44 yard line. I think he really sort of lost exactly where he was and he wasn't concentrating on what he needed to do on this play, but he went out of bounds and one yard short of the first down. And what happened was, obviously, as Miles said, you know, in the open, that then Andy Dalton threw an incompletion and uh, Tampa Bay got a punt. You know, New Orleans had to punt and that led to the first score. What I thought was so interesting that I really, really liked a lot about this is what Mark Ingram tweeted uh, after the game. And he said, and I'm going to read his tweet. I'm sick about this one. Regardless of circumstances or how I feel, I have to get that fresh set of downs for the squad. I apologize to my teammates and my coaches and my city for a crucial mistake. We work way too hard and sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. I will be better. I mean, what do you want out of Mark Ingram? Yeah. That is as good a player apology as I've ever heard. Yeah, it, it's it's taking accountability for sure. And, and, you know, he knows exactly what he should be doing in that situation. He's a veteran running back. And I also think it's worth noting that he was dealing with an injury. He's dealing with leg injury, right? So it's not like he was fully yeah. healthy. And it, it doesn't change the outcome of the game. But certainly, if you make a mistake, one of the things players and coaches talk about all the time is accountability. Are you going to be responsible and take responsibility for the things that you do or don't do? And, you know, that there's nothing more you could want from Mark Ingram in terms of taking the accountability, but that doesn't really change the result of what the game was, unfortunately. And you still didn't get that first down, and it was still a critical mistake. You know, it's interesting. The Cameron Jordan talked last night after the game, hmm. you know, the great defensive end of the Saints. One and he said, hey, you know, yes. hand it to Tom Brady. Yeah. Hand it to Tom Brady. Uh, you know, can't give him the ball twice in the last five minutes. Blah, 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 blah. But he did get bailed out by, this is Cameron Jordan, but he did get bailed out by a Pulse and a Debo pass interference call that gave him the ball at the one and, and you know, put him in prime position for that first touchdown. Uh, the touchdown pass to rookie tight end Kate Otten. And so... I, I, I only make that point because the reality of these two drives, two long drives for touchdowns in the last minute, you got to make plays, but you also got to get some help. And they got some help on this interference. I'm not killing the interference call at all. Yeah. Um, I saw the call. Uh, I, I can't, I'm not arguing with the call in any way. But what I am saying is that, look, let's, let's look at this from 10,000 feet. Right now, Miles. Okay, they won the game. Brady is Brady, all that. They're six and six. They've got a basically a game and a half, almost a two game lead. I just want to make sure that I'm right in saying that. Yeah, six and six, and the and Atlanta's five and eight. So they basically have a two game lead because they own the tiebreaker right now over Atlanta. And right. look, <clears throat> the Bucks have a difficult schedule. I don't see them going out to San Francisco and winning that game even though it's Tom Brady against Brock Purdy, just a slight mismatch. And uh, so, you know, it's not automatic that they're going to win this division. But that game last night put him in great position. I think my question is, let's look at where Tampa Bay is right now. They're, they're certainly going to be the fourth seed in the NFC playoffs or whoever wins that division. Let's just say Tampa's the fourth seed, whatever they are, eight and nine, I don't know, whatever their final record is. But most likely, they're going to host the Dallas Cowboys in the first game of the playoffs. If it's not Dallas, it'll probably be Philadelphia. Now, mm -hmm. Tampa has a very competitive defense that can keep their team in any game. The question is, can their offense score enough can they run it well enough? I think Rashad White gives them a much better option right now than Leonard Fournette. But be that as it may, Dallas at Tampa. As of right now, what would the line on that game be? I mean, I it's got to be Dallas by six, right? 
I mean, uh, yeah. We, well, really, just take a wild guess. What would the line on that game be right now? Yeah, you know, have, have Dallas four and a half, maybe just because of the Brady factor, and you know that defense is. Yeah. Cool. But I mean, the offense of Dallas has been so 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 good, particularly since Dak Prescott's returned. They've got more touchdowns than anybody yeah. else, and I don't know exactly what that set is. I saw it the other day, but it, it's it's one of those situations where. I would feel pretty confident saying that Dallas or Philadelphia's offense can go in there and stomp out the Buccaneers in a way that we haven't necessarily seen from the lesser teams, you know, that have allowed the Buccaneers to stay in it because yeah, Tom Brady can do magical, wonderful things. But if you have an offense that can execute a four minute drive, like I believe the Eagles and the Cowboys can, I don't know that you're going to allow Tom Brady the opportunity to then come back and do this special Tom Brady thing in the last two minutes. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's any shame in, in either. Uh, Nobody's going to apologize for winning. And yes, Tampa has got some issues. I think this all goes back to Ryan Jensen getting hurt in the second game uh, or second practice of training camp uh, and then losing both guards. It has been a real struggle for Tom Brady. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed he's, he's still standing quite honestly. And now, you know, Tristan Wirfs, his injury, mm-hmm. it's just the whole season has been a struggle. So look, hats off to them. If they can find some way to win the division and host a playoff game, you know, I, I just make one other point about about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, okay? So at, in Tom Brady's age, 43, 44, and 45 seasons, his three ages, you tell me what sporting feat, if they make the playoffs this year, would would be better than a guy in the NFL, a quarterback at age 43, 44, and 45, leading his team to the playoffs every year and winning one Super Bowl. I mean, look, of all the things that Brady has accomplished, that to me is going to go down. I, I mean, that's not better than winning all those Super Bowls in New England, obviously. Six Super Bowls is, a, is an unbelievable feat. But I'll just say that, you know, what he's accomplished in Tampa, even in a lean year like this one, and going through an absolutely torturous divorce. Uh, that we don't know all the details about now, but I have a feeling that one day we'll hear some stories about what kind of year this was for Tom Brady. So anyway, I just, there's a lot to be said about the Bucks hanging in there, uh, you know, if they if they win this division. Miles, I, I want to go to the San Francisco 49ers Miami game. For those who did not read my column this week, Football Morning in America at NBCSports.com, uh, and at profootballtalk.com. Um, we, uh, I went to this football game in Santa Clara. Just a couple of things about it. So I landed Saturday late afternoon in San Jose, and it was pouring rain. And I looked at my weather app on my phone, and it was supposed to rain Sunday. I said, you know, I want to see the Miami Dolphins in all of their glory. I don't want to see them on a muddy field. I don't want to see Tyreek Hill, you know, on a muddy field. I want to see them be able to be great. Or I want to be able to see San Francisco's defense stop them. And so I thought what was really interesting, I got up Sunday morning, I I took a four-mile walk on this lovely trail in Mountain View, California, and... I came back to my room, packed up, and went over because I wanted to watch the early games over at the press box. And I started thinking to myself, you know, this is really a lovely day. Somehow, some way, the meteorologist got it wrong. And I said, we are going to see a great football game. And I just was excited because I don't go on the road very much anymore. This is only my fourth game that I've been to this year. And so most of the time I sit in my apartment, uh, watch the games, get on the phone with people. But I was so happy driving over to the stadium because I said, we're going to see a really good game. And on the first play of the game, what do we see? We see uh, Tua Tonga-Valoa 
hit Trent Sherfield 10 yards down the right seam and Sherfield runs the last 65 yards and the first play of the game, you say, okay, this is what we came to see. The explosive mm-hmm. Dolphins. And it's not even Jalen Waddell or Tyreek Hill. Right. It's Trent <laughs> Sherfield, the former 49er. Uh, it, it, was just, it was really just amazing. But anyway, so we, 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 we get through that period and, and then Garoppolo goes down. I don't think anybody really thought that it was that serious an injury because it, although it looked like his foot got crunched, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, you know, he, he, he kind of walked off the field and I don't think anybody thought it was dire, but as it turns out, um, midway through the second quarter, Kyle Shanahan is, is standing on the sidelines and Dustin Little, the head athletic trainer, for the uh, 49ers goes up to him and he waits for there to be a little pause, you know, and there's a TV timeout and Dustin Little goes up to Shanahan and he says, uh, coach, it's, it's not good. Jimmy's got something broken in his foot. And Kyle Shanahan, who clearly was not thinking that this was going to be the issue. He's not thinking, you know, that it's bad. He looks, okay, well, how long, how long? Yeah, you know, how long is he out for? And he said, "Oh, it's the season. You know, it's it's going to be. He's going to be out probably at least six months." So Shanahan is just thinking to himself, "This this track meet of a game is going on around him. He's got Brock Purdy, the 262nd pick in the draft, trying to beat the most explosive offense in football. Uh, and and you know, he just so he doesn't tell anybody. He doesn't tell a soul." And at halftime, a few players filter into the trainer's room. They see Garoppolo, and Garoppolo said, my foot's broken, I'm done for the year. And these guys are just crushed for him. But I just want to tell you one thing that I find so interesting about football players. And that is, after the game, um, I talked to Aziz al Shair, the linebacker of the 49ers, who is just, for an undrafted free agent, this guy is a man out there. He is a sideline-to-sideline force. 49ers might lose him. He's going to be a free agent this year. I'll tell you one thing. I'd want that guy as the nerve center of my defense. Uh, I think he's a great football player. But And who knows? Maybe the 49ers will be able to keep him, but they got to pay so many people on that defense that you know this could be the last few weeks for... Al Shire in a in a 49ers uniform. But whatever. So he said, I, I asked him about it, and he goes, you know, basically, this is the life we've chosen. And we're obviously really kind of sick for Jimmy, but he said it could happen to me, could happen to anybody on any play. And he goes, We just were absolutely unequivocally determined that. Nothing is going to stop us in this game. We're going to shut this offense down. And look, except for the Trent Sherfield play, and then the bomb late to Tyreek Hill, you know, for the long touchdown, that basically was it. Mm-hmm. I think what the 49ers did in this game is really make Tua Tonga-Valoa uncomfortable. And, you know... Tua's been so accurate this year. His inaccuracy Sunday was weird to me. It was just very, very strange. Through a lot of high balls, through a lot of low balls, you know, even some of the catches guys made, they had to be acrobatic to catch him. So, look, I don't think Tua, uh, uh, you know, I don't think this is going to, uh, uh, you know, basically linger for Tua. He's fine. He's still having a great year overall. But this is a tough defense to face your thoughts after watching this defense against Tua and what does it mean really for the Dolphins well I I think that the 49ers have one of the best defenses we've seen in a while you know I mean this is an offensive league at this point you know it's a passing league it's all about yards it's all about touchdowns that's exciting it's what we all like to see but 
to me, the 49ers defense is really, really, really exciting to watch because everybody plays with such speed, with such tenacity, with such ferocity that these are the kinds of things you're going to see. And I think you're absolutely right on, on Tua Tonga Vailoa. He was just off. And, you know, you could watch it and you could yeah. see whether it was the high stuff, the low stuff. And maybe it had to do with the fact that, A, you're playing that particular defense, but B, you're playing without both of your starting offensive tackles. That probably is going to affect you in some way if you're a quarterback. Uh, just that's at least the sense that I could get, you know, sitting here in Los Angeles and watching that game up, you know, up the state in the Bay Area. So I think that that's one thing. But, you know, you look at, the 49ers in particular, and you say, well, if they can do that against that explosive offense, then what exactly can't they do? You know, because yeah, you gave up some right. explosive plays, but that's the dolphins. They're going to get theirs. Eventually most teams can't do that. So if the 49ers are going to still be contenders, that's why, because that defense is really that good. And, you know, you mentioned that Al Shair is going to be a free agent. If D'Amico Ryans is going to be a head coach somewhere next year, yeah. which I mean, why wouldn't he be at this point? I don't know. Obviously I'm not privy to interviews or anything, but that, that would probably be one of my first moves. Bring that guy in and bring him with me as a free agent. Because look, I mean, if the way, that that defense runs there you're gonna need dudes in order to be playmakers and you know if wherever he goes that would be one that would be very obvious to me where he should follow let's talk for a minute about brock purdy and you're right i think i think this game did more for D'Amico ryan's head coaching opportunities than any game he has coached as a defensive coordinator since robert sala left yeah. Um, but let's talk about Brock Purdy for a second. So, Miles, I think the fashionable thing to say in the wake of this game is that, yeah, the 49ers will probably win the division. They got to beat the Seahawks somehow. The Seahawks just hang on and keep punching teams in the mouth. And they've got a very accurate quarterback uh, who makes some big plays. And, you know, Geno Smith, gosh. I mean, every week where you think, well, Seahawks will fall to earth. And it looked like they started to fall to earth for a while. Yeah. But but anyway, we'll see. But I I just, I was so impressed with Brock Purdy. The situation he came into, having to play the last 50 minutes of a game that uh, everybody was looking at as the coming out party of the Miami Dolphins. And now Brock Purdy has got to hold the fort. Um, so I met with Purdy after the game both he and separately, he and Kyle Shanahan. And just give you a couple of observations about Brock Purdy. So he really looks like he's 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he shaves much. And, you know, he does not look like a quarterback in the NFL. He's kind of got a slight build to him. He's very modest but you can tell once he starts talking that he believes in himself more than anybody has a right to after what he's done in football. And But I think what's really interesting about him that people discount, look, the Big 12 is not the SEC. Sure. But Brock Purdy started in the Big 12 for three and a half years. I want you to think about that compared to like a Trey Lance right. who started, I think it was 19 right. games or whatever uh, at, you know, the division one double a level. I always get it confused whether that's F C S B S whatever, but you know, Brock Purdy basically has played two and a half times as much football uh, coming into the NFL as Trey Lance played. And, and so that's, that's one thing. He's played a lot of football. When you got to go to Norman, Oklahoma and Austin, Texas and, and Iowa City and you've got to, you've played in some tough places to play football. So that is an advantage for him. And secondly, I, I, I'll just give you a little window into what I saw after the game. I said to him, you know, your reward now 
is that the first start of your NFL career, you are going to, you get to play Tom Brady. I said, that has got to just kind of blow you away. And he said, pretty cool. The GOAT, he's been playing football longer than I've been alive. And he just, you know, hey, that's the guy who I'm going to be facing this week. It's fine. I'll show up on Sunday and we'll see what happens. And I absolutely love that approach. One of the things Kyle Shanahan told me after the game is that in training camp, there were three or four moments where they looked at Brock Purdy and they said, this guy is more than a, just a guy we're going to dump on the practice squad. You know, mm. <laughs> this guy. And so they thought so much of him that they uh, basically dumped their backup quarterback to give Brock Purdy the job, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the number three job. And even after uh, they lost Trey Lance, Shanahan said, that's okay. Brock Purdy is going to be our backup to Jimmy Garoppolo. So that is what really tells you everything. They're willing, hey, look, no one's going to say Nate Sudfeld is any future John Unitas or anything. But, you know, he was a guy who had played in some games in the NFL, had experience. And basically the the the, the 49ers were willing just to let him go and to give the job to, to Brock Purdy. So I'll be honest with you. I, I think he's got a chance. I think he's got a chance to be a competitive player with a great defense. And as long as that defense stays healthy, I think they have a chance to fulfill that what they were going to do this year. Look, do I think that Brock Purdy uh, and that team can can waltz into Philadelphia uh, and and win a football game? No, I don't. But I do think that all is is not lost. Um, yeah. I so we'll see what happens. I think it's I think it's going to be fun, but what do you think the fate of the 49ers is now? Well, I, I think it's tough just because I that defense, like I said, it's so good. And Brock Purdy, for everything that he is not, and, you know, the experience factor in the NFL, I, I really do think is something. You know, there's a reason why he lasted until the seventh round. And regardless of how yep. good the system is, and I think Kyle Shanahan's system is one of the best, if not the best in the league, there are still some limitations that are going to inherently come through. But I'll, I'll tell you, the, the most impressive play I thought Brock Purdy made was late in the second quarter. It was third and 10. Miami brings the house on the blitz. And somehow Brock Purdy stands tall in the pocket and he fires through the teeth of that thing. And he finds George Kittle over the middle. They get 19 yards and a first down and they're able to keep that drive going. If Brock Purdy can continuously make plays like that, then that's going to be how the 49ers are going to be able to win games because teams are going to test him as a young quarterback defensively. Can you stand up to everything that we send to you? You know, disguising coverages, doing different things with different blitzes and all that. If he can do those kinds of things and be consistent on third down and make the throw that you have to make like he did at that point in the game, then the 49ers are going to be okay. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. Philadelphia still is at the top of the NFC in my mind, uh, you know, and the Cowboys after the way they dismantled the Colts. Yes, they're still one of the top NFC teams, but I don't think you can just throw the 49ers out there just because they're starting Brock Purdy. I wrote about that play in my column, the play you're talking mm -hmm. about. And that play says everything to me as I wrote, I, I hate when um, we, uh, we we sort of make one play mean everything about a football game. So I'm not a big fan of that. But on that particular play, and people may remember it, they may not, but on that particular play, um, the Miami Dolphins had an eight-man front, and they had been pummeling Brock Purdy and rushing and blitzing and making him make some bad throws and having to throw the ball away. And on this particular play, they put eight on the line of scrimmage. They only rushed four, but one of the four was Jalen Phillips, first round pick from 2021. And Jalen Phillips came up, nobody touched him. And he was bearing in on Brock Purdy to just bury him. And at the time, 
Brock Purdy had to change the play at the line of scrimmage to basically tell George Kittle, shorten your route and look for the ball quick. Uh, in some parlance at the line of scrimmage, he said that, and he threw that ball. And look, I know you get numbed by a lot of these next-gen numbers, but I work with next-gen now in my column. And Brock Purdy th released that ball 1.72 seconds after he took the snap. There have only been five other throws this year in the NFL, five other completions that a quarterback has thrown the ball down the field. We're not just talking about a flip or, you know, one of those little extended handoffs that count as a pass to the back in motion. But throwing the ball down the field, and he threw the ball to George Kittle, and as you said, gain of 19, and he got absolutely smoked. As Purdy told me after the game, I think that showed something to the fellas. And, I mean, I talked to four players in the locker room who said yes, that showed something to the fellas, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, look, we, 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 we're going we're gonna to go to Tom Coughlin here, but I would just leave you with the fact that Bill Walsh, I'll never forget him, him telling me this. Um, when they drafted Charles Haley in 1986, maybe, they had a great draft. I think it was 86. And they drafted him out of James Madison uh, in the third round, I think it was. And he had had a very checkered college career at a mid-level school, James Madison. And after the draft, he was asked what happened. And I talked to him about this as well. Um, and I asked him what happened. And uh, he said, basically, if I've seen a player do something once or twice, you ought to be able to coach him to do it consistently. And that's why they took Charles Haley. Turned out to be a very prescient draft choice. And honestly, when I saw that play from Brock Purdy, I said, okay, he can do that with pressure, a six foot six pass rusher. He knows he's going to get a rib broken or whatever. Uh, you know, what, what does that say about him? And it says to me that all hope is not lost. Now, We've got a lot to get to on the backside of this podcast. Miles and I are going to play lightning round. We're going to take one minute on six different topics. And so you don't want to miss that. But first, we're going to go to my conversation with Tom Coughlin, who coached two Super Bowl champions with the New York Giants. But the one he did 15 years ago this year, he's got a new book out about it. We'll talk about it. And he talks about what happened that season to make it so magical. Here's my conversation with Tom Coughlin. Back on the podcast, so happy to be joined by Tom Coughlin, the two-time Super Bowl winning head coach um, of the New York Giants. Uh, he's got a book out. It's called A Giant Win, Inside the New York Giants' Historic Upset Over the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 52. Um, 40, or I'm sorry, 40, in Super Bowl 42, excuse me. Um, there's a forward there by Eli Manning. Um, and I was telling Tom before we started, I really, I was there for a, some of it, not, not a lot of it really, but I won't, we're going to touch on a few of the things that he writes about in this book. Um, but also, obviously, I, I want to pass along my uh, sympathy and and for so many of my readers and listeners um, who felt awful um, to see the news of uh, Tom's wife of 55 years, Judy, uh, who died on November 1st um, of a progressive brain disease. And uh, Tom, first of all, sorry for that. And, and uh, I, I'm sure that even after a month, you still are dealing every day with the loss of someone who was everything in your world for 55 years. No question, Peter. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a very difficult time. There isn't any doubt about it. And what we went through and I've, I've, I've said many times is that you're never ready. You're never ready. I don't care how much notice you have. I don't care what, when the time comes that the good Lord is going to take your loved one away, you're not ready for that. And, 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 and you, you go through an incredible 
number of emotions. And, you know, I had three of my four kids here when, when, when Judy passed away and she passed away at three 31 in the morning. And Peter, for, for you, who has been a great supporter of the J fund, you know what that number 31 means to us. Uh, that was Jay McGillis's number, but that is, wow. but, but, but to have her, to have the, the impact that Judy's made on our lives, you know, it, it's interesting. You mentioned the 55 years, what I said at our celebration for life. And I, and I wanted un people to understand where I was coming from is that we were married for 55 years for the last five. I have been Judy's caregiver. Okay. For the first 50 years, she was my caregiver. She did everything to allow me to focus on the advancement of my career. Even as far back as being a, a division three head coach, she, I coached, I worked and she did everything else. And because she was that way, I was able to, because I'm one of those guys that puts the blinders on and, uh, and it's all encompassing for me. It's like everything else you do in life. When I became a caregiver, that was it. That was my job. That was, I was going to do that to the best of my ability without distraction. And I hope I was able to do that. I thought one of the greatest things I've read in recent years was your essay for the New York Times on what it was like to be a caregiver because we all know someone in our lives who does this. Uh, it, whether it be a relative or a friend or something, somebody's life has been totally uh, it's been totally taken over by this life that you never ever expected that you would lead, but it hits you and you deal with it as you did. And I just want to read one short passage from this and, and talk about caregiving just for a moment. Caregiving is all consuming. It is mentally and physically exhausting. Sometimes you just need a break. When Judy is having a good day, then my day is good. But then there are dark days, these days that are so full of frustration and anger, they have me feeling like a failure and pondering the unfairness of the disease. I've spent my entire life preparing for some of the biggest games a person could play, but nothing can prepare you to be a caregiver who has to watch a loved one slip away. The emotion that I felt when I read that was just just because tom you know i've been around you in so many times when you had all the control i was around yes. you in san francisco after an incredible playoff win uh it, it, you know once and you were in control of that team most people thought you had no business winning that game or winning the game against the patriots when in either game against the Patriots, but you had control. In these, in this situation, you had zero control uh, other than, you know, caring for Judy. I, I, I guess I would just ask, do you think that caregivers in general, okay, get appreciated enough for the lives they have to surrender because of the life they have to take care of not at all peter not at all and that's why quite frankly i wrote the article because i thought that i could help others in this situation and listen thank god i mean i had the wherewithal to have other help too and there's a there's a lot of people that don't have that they don't have the wherewithal the financial ability to surround themselves with others that can help as well and it believe me with, with Judy's care, it took two. I was one caregiver, but I had a caregiver. I had someone here, you know, for at least 12 hours a day who to help me with the chores that come with caregiving so that I could feel good about what we were doing. But caregiving is totally all consuming. And, you know, people say to you, you got to take care of yourself. And you, after a while, you, you, you know, that sounds self-serving to me. Peter, it's not self-serving. People have to learn how to take care of themselves because if they don't, they cannot be there for their loved one. And it goes, you when mentioning a bad day, that's a bad day mentally. I mean, you feel like you're inept. And I would sit there in the early going and I would say to myself, 
I'm not good at this. What am I doing here? Why, why am I trying this? Because I, I can't get things done the way I want them to be done. And so you go through that. And then there's a the physical part. You know, you, you have to, I mean, I've always been, you know me, I've always been somebody that was conditioned once or twice a day. I'd be in the weight room at 5.15. I'd be cardio work at the end of the day, all that. Stuff. But you know what? The way you set up your day is completely around the person that you love. So the structure of the day would be six in the morning, literally until eight at night, but there would be a nap in the afternoon. So the nap in the afternoon would be when you think, you know, while Judy was napping that I could do something. Well, some days you can't do any more than take a nap yourself. And then there's other days where you try to car cardiovascular work or whatever. I've got some dumbbells in the basement, you know, all that kind of stuff. Guess what? Some days are better than others with regard to that. But you do have to take care of yourself because if you can't perform uh, at the level that that is required, now you, you've got even more trouble. Now I have I have two of my children that are here in Jacksonville, and I have two children in New Jersey. So I had people, loved ones, that would come and give a break. I might have a Saturday afternoon where I would take two or three hours off and watch, you know, a college football game or something like that. But the idea of, of in the morning, if I would look in Judy's eyes and she would smile at me and for a while I could get her to say good morning. I would say good morning, Jude, because I always made a big deal about the morning. You know, put the blinds up, turn the, the show, turn a, a news show on, you know, make her feel really important about the start of the day. And if I could get her to smile, that was my day. That, that made the rest of my day. I, I was great. If I couldn't, now I'm like, oh boy, you know, and, and that would haunt me for the entire day. So it is, it is, uh, the, the article was written to point the message at all those millions of people who are, who go without notice, who are performing a caregiving role out of love for their husband or wife or mother or father, whatever it might be who go unnoticed to hopefully recognize the contribution there that they're making to their loved ones. It was beautifully done. And um, Judy was lucky to have a person like you around her, uh, especially at the end. Uh, but I, I did just want to say that I know that we're talking to discuss your book in this incredible season, but I, I just had to talk about that for a moment. It's part of the um, book. Tom, I want it's to... part of the book. I, yeah, yeah, that's great. I want to uh, switch to football. And this, when you walked away, particularly um, when you walked away from the Giants and, you know, when you were told they were going in a different direction, whatever the, the phraseology was. But when you left the Giants, you know, I remember one day I was looking at pro football reference and I looked there and I said, only 11 coaches in NFL history have won more games than Tom Coughlin. When I say that, and when you realize that, this sport that you revere so much, this sport that you grew up just wishing somehow, some way, you know, you could have an association with, and you worked so hard that you became the 12th winningest coach in NFL history. What do you think of when you think about that? <laughs> I think about all the all the years and all the all the relationships and all the people, and you know Peter when 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 I, I probably had one fault, okay, that when I was hired, you know I always told the players, you know you have to maintain you have to show ownership in your in your team, you have to believe in your team to the point where you are so proud to be there that all your actions and everything that you do uh, epitomize that you believe that that you're such a part of this that you would do 
everything in your power to make it the best you could possibly be. I've always done that. I've done that to the point of fault. And I will, and I will always continue. That's my way. So when I think of the Jacksonville Jaguars, the New York Giants, my time, I had 22 years as a head coach in the NFL. I think of my time, you know, I, I'm proud of that fact. But obviously it comes with some bumps in the road. Uh, but but those were always my thoughts. Um, this book obviously centers on one of the most interesting seasons, one of the most interesting uh, games, uh, really in NFL history, when you think about it, Tom. Uh, you know, there's so much about this season in general that is interesting. But I want to start even before that and ask you about this sort of seminal moment in your relationship with Eli Manning where he went up to you after he played an awful game early in his career, near mm -hmm. tears, and talked to you about that. I want you to tell that story because I think it is so illustrative of what happened between you and Eli Manning. That situation, Eli's rookie year, we had Kurt Warner and we had Eli Manning, and they competed in training camp. Kurt, Kurt won the job. So Kurt was the starter. Eli was the backup. At a certain point in the season where I thought we dipped in terms of our performance, and I felt that it was time for us to insert Eli into the starting role. You know the story about me making him draw every blitz and all that stuff, and I did that all, all throughout his rookie year. And he thought it was, oh, this guy, you know, he's not paying attention to that. And he came in with one that wasn't done so well one time, and I ripped him. And I had red marks all over his paper and all that stuff. So we make the change, and he's a rookie. And <clears throat> the game is fast. The game is fast. So we go back to back against the Redskins and then against Baltimore, and they blitz, literally blitz probably 50% of the time. And he has an awful time with it, you know. He can't see it coming. He doesn't react well to it. He can't get the ball to the hots. You know, we get he the 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 kid gets hit and hit and hit. So we lose to Baltimore, and it's not pretty. And we come home, and uh, you know, no player wants to wants to come into the head coach's office. You know that <laughs> they they want to avoid that at all costs. Monday morning, real early in the morning, I'm at my desk and I look up, and here he comes. And he comes in and he sits in the chair across from me. He's very close to tears. And he starts with the process of coach. You know, I, I know I didn't play very well yesterday. I didn't handle the, the pressure very well. I got frustrated. I let it get to me. You know, I had my dauber down. It only enhanced more and more lack of success. But he, but he's, he's pretty much got tears in his eye. He said, coach, I know, I know I can be the quarterback of the New York Giants, and I know we can win. And I'm just, I'm just a listener. You know, I'm now the sponge, okay? He's telling me from the soul what he believes. I can do this. I can be, I can be the guy. Well, you know, we lost six games in a row <clears throat> when we're transitioning to Eli. But Mr. Mara came in my office right after I made the change and said, you and I think alike. I would have done the same thing. So the Dallas game comes, the last game of the year. Parcells' team is not very good. We're not very good. We both got, I don't know, five and 11 records or whatever. And we come to the end of the game, okay? We've got the ball inside the five. There's, we have no timeouts. The clock is running. Eli checks from a pass to a run. And I don't know if you remember this. Hands the ball to Tiki Barber, and the thing pushes forward, and Tiki gets in the end zone, and we beat the Cowboys. And, and that was, again, another indication. Can you imagine? Ball's at maybe the three-yard line. And knowing that he doesn't have any more time, all right, he looks it over. He sees that they're going to defend the pass. He checks to the run. He hands the run off, and thank God – Tiki and the offensive lineman pushed that thing into the end zone, and we end up winning the game. 
And that's the one that carried us throughout the whole off season because it had been nothing but losses up until that time. And then of course comes back his second year and wins 11 games. <clears throat> what I, what I remember early on is that as you know, um, I mean, Zach Wilson's kind of going through it now with the Jets. If you're the quarterback of a team in New York City and you've been picked high in the draft, it is in the immortal words of Bill Parcells, either euphoria or disaster. And, you know, Eli Manning, I hope he kept some of the back pages over the years where he was ridiculed, given mm -hmm. up on, this guy was given up on 64 times in his At first least. two or three years where get this At guy least. out of here and everything. This is no Manning, all that, you know? And I just always thought to myself, you know, it really takes whatever you think of Eli Manning, whether you think he's a Hall of Famer, what, what, whatever, whatever it is, it takes a really strong person to be able to withstand what someone in New York has to withstand when they're going under the hailstorm of daily getting beat up in the press. Yeah. It's just different than most places. How do you think Peter, he I'm survived gonna... all that? Peter, yeah. let me take you back to his rookie year. We just drafted him. Yeah. Okay. He comes in among all the, you know, the guys can't get done writing about the trade that Ernie Accorsi made and all the, all that we owed because we brought Eli Manning in and blah, 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 blah. Peter, and you remember those days, the rookie minicamp, all right? The kid comes in, he doesn't even know the cadence, okay? He's, he doesn't know the cadence. He doesn't, whoever the rookie center was, I don't even remember, but they probably couldn't get the ball up. He goes out his first day of practice. And, you know, the ball doesn't come out real well. He's not throwing the ball real, real good. He's not sure what the calls are. He, it's the first time he's ever heard any language, which was New York Giant language. And they ripped him in yeah. the paper. And they ripped him in the paper, <laughs> not for his bad start. I mean, it, it's, it's New York. Okay, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But I always thought to myself, are you serious? Are you serious? Come on. Let's let the kid learn how to take the ball from the center first, all right? Let's, let's let him have a couple of days to get the cadence down. Set hot. You know, you can't make it up, Peter. That was, it was too much. Um, Tom, there's a couple of things about your season that obviously are, are you know, are littered throughout this book. You know, the season that obviously ended with you beating the Patriots in the Super Bowl. But what really interests me the most in that whole season, almost as much as the Super Bowl itself, is the last Saturday night of the regular season when you're playing New England at home. New England is 15-0. and 0. Uh, The NFL in those days used to play. I mean, the NFL schedule has changed so much. But this was 15 years ago, and the NFL had a primetime game on a Saturday night. I think they put it on NFL Network, which was new at the time. And then it was so big that they ended up putting it on national TV. And, yeah. and, and so, and it was just, it was a really, really big deal. And I remember part of the story was you saying, even though, you know, you had, you didn't have anything to play for per se as it relates to the playoffs. You were going to play to win the game. And there was so much said and written about that. But I want you to go back to the decision you made to do that and why you did it. We win, we beat Buffalo in Buffalo. And you remember that game. It was, I've never seen weather like that in my life. It was, it was 40 miles an hour. During the course of the game, it rained, it snowed, it sleeted. It did it all, okay? Everybody scored going one way. Nobody could score going into the wind. That was, that was not going to happen. They jump out 14-0. Yeah. We got to win one game to get in, okay? And I had, after we lost to Washington at home, 
I walked in the next day and my, my team was ready to get ripped. They thought it was coming. I looked at them and I said, gentlemen, we have two games remaining. We have to win one game to get into the playoffs. I suggest we go to Buffalo and win because if we don't, we're going to have to beat the undefeated New England Patriots at home. I walked out. Well, we went up to Buffalo and won. As soon as we win, Peter, you know how this goes because it's scripted somewhere in the in a writer's, okay, coach, you're going to play your starters? And it started. It started right away. You know, what are you going to do next week? I mean, what are you going to do? And I listened to that a little bit and, you know, I went on into my office or whatever. And I, I thought to myself, we are the New York Giants. We are the flagship team of the National Football League. We are red, white, and blue. I am not going to allow that future historians would look back upon this game where the Giants would play the Patriots, the Patriots having a chance to have an undefeated season, and the New York Giants do not put their best foot forward. We are going to play our starters. We are going to play to win. And when I told our team that on Monday, they rallied. They wanted to play against the 15-0 and New England Patriots. And if you remember, Peter, 38-35. We're leading in the fourth quarter. We got the lead. And it's one of those games where, you know, they beat us, but when we walked off, we knew we could play with them. Well, what I remember about that game is the emotion of the crowd. You at one point had a 28-16 to lead in that yeah. game. And then Brady went crazy, threw that bomb to Randy Moss. You know, the, the real signature Tom Brady to Randy Moss throw, yeah. uh, 65 yards or whatever it was, beautiful yeah. throw. Moss was so, yeah. But but what I really remember, I don't know, I, I but do you remember late in that game, it looks like it's over. You're down 38, 28. You get the ball at whatever you're 20 or 25. Eli took him the length of the field. And yep. you score a touchdown. Now it's 38, 35. And all of a sudden, it's still a game. And yep. I just remember thinking, this is, and I know you're going to hate these two words. You, I guarantee you. I said to myself, I'm sitting in the press box. This is the greatest moral victory in NFL history. It's an incredible performance yeah. by the New York yeah. Giants against a team that had everything in terms of history to play for. You got the great Belichick, the great Brady, the great Moss on the other side trying to do what, you know, trying to be the Miami Dolphins of 72. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know. When you walked off the field that day, tell me what you were thinking. Well, when I walked off the field, I got to tell you one more story because this is where you're, this is where, this is what will be most meaningful to you. You will remember as soon as I tell you. So we go in and, you know, we lost the game, but, you know, I keep it the way it should be. It was a great performance. I'm really proud of my team. You know, they're the, if that's the world that's the team that's 16 and oh we know we can play with them you know all that stuff next morning at five o'clock i come into my to my office and i see the red lights on the voicemail so i pick up the phone and i you know it's john madden and john madden is calling me and he's saying tom i just wanted to call because i want you to know that is the greatest thing that's happened to the nfl in the last 10 years, he said, wow, National Football League, we don't not play our players. We owe our responsibility to our fans to perform every day. And that's what you did. And I'm just so proud to be a part of that. And I'm so proud of what you've accomplished and what your team has accomplished. He said, I'm very emotional right now. He said, I'm very emotional right now. But I want you to know how I felt. I played it for my team. And it was moving, very moving. Wow. That is, I knew he made the call. I didn't realize all, all that he said. Um, Tom, you know, the one other thing, I, I'm going to ask you uh, a, an NFL quiz about that game, which I realized last night when I was figuring out what I was going to talk to you about. And 
I want you to tell me if you remember. You you score to come within 38-35. There's a minute mm-hmm. four left in the game, and Lawrence Tynes kicks an onside kick. The Patriots right. recover. Do you remember who recovered for the Patriots? No. Mike Vrabel. Did he? Yeah, well, I don't, yeah. I don't doubt it. <laughs> I'll tell you something. You got to remember this, Peter. That's the greatest scoring team in the history of the National Football League at the time. Okay. And everybody's looking strictly at the greatest quarterback of all time, surrounded by the team that he was surrounded by, Moss and all of the defense was fourth in the league. Vrabel. And you put up and you put up 35 on him. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean it just to tell you the quality of the team he had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about the Super Bowl itself now in the remaining time that we have left. But first I want to go to your practice on Friday uh, (laughs) in Arizona. The Super Bowl is going to be in Arizona and you obviously uh, are practicing out in Arizona for that week. And as the week goes on, you're not sure that you're going to have Plexico Burris for that game. And Plexico Burris is obviously, you know, the key target uh, for Eli Manning. You you might have known that whether he was going to play or not, but still you had to get your guys ready for the game. But Tom, I want to start before that Friday practice and tell and and go back to a story about David Tyree. David Tyree had some troubles earlier in his career, and mm-hmm. uh he had some some drug issues. And I think a lot of people felt that even though he was one of the best special teams players in football, that He was not going to have a long career with the New York Giants. Even with his troubles, why did you keep David Tyree around? The story goes this way, okay? One day I'm in my office. It's uh, the offseason. Ernie, of course, he comes to the door. He's got David Tyree with him. He ushers David Tyree in. He says to me, do what you will with him. David sits down. He had had an incident with the police where he had a certain amount of marijuana in the trunk of his car. Um, And he was sure he was going to, he was going to be fired. Going to be, he started to talk to me and explain. And he was extremely, extremely, he was crying. Okay. He was out of control crying. He was trying to convince me that he had led a life of this type of thing, alcohol, drugs, that type of thing, but that he had changed his ways and he had become more devout and he was aware of what he had done, Bob. And and he, he was trying to convince me that, that he would change. And I listened and he's a, David is a Syracuse guy. And I listened, and I listened. Yep. And I felt without saying much that I would, I would give him a chance. I would give him a chance to prove to me that he had changed. And so when he left my office, he was still a giant. He was, he was convinced he was gone when Ernie brought him down, but we kept him. And you know, the quality of the player that he was, he had, he and Jeff Fiegels were the, the incredible twosome that hunted the ball down like you made a fair catch, caught the ball inside the 10 on a punt and start the opponent inside the 10 kind of thing. But he was on all special teams. He was very physical. We used him on short yardage because he could, he was physical and could block. Um, so let's go to that Friday in practice. I didn't know this until sometime after the game that Amani Toomer who I knew pretty well on your team told me, he said, Peter, you, you have to find out about this practice on Friday. 
said David Tyree was awful. He said <laughs> he, he, he had a very hard time catching the ball. You just need to ask around uh, about exactly what happened. And sure enough, I asked around. Um, he dropped somewhere between three and five very catchable balls. And I, I've never, I don't think I've ever even talked to you about this, but you had to be thinking in the back of your mind, oh my God, this guy might be our only hope. I, I, I mean, are we going to even call a play to throw him the ball? Tell me what you saw in that Friday practice. Well, he had a terrible practice. But, you know, you have to remember that where I am with these with this team, you know, I've said over and over, we practiced so well, we worked so well together, uh, we had come so far that I, I was literally, I don't know if it's the right term, but I was at peace with where we were, who we were, and – and we, we had had so many up and downs. I didn't consider this as, you know, a, an indication of what was to come. I was also assisted by the fact that, and I mean, it was bad, Peter. I mean, we had, we had a special play in, you know, David Tyree's touchdown in the game. We had a special play in that looked exactly like run. He's in the game. You know it's a run because that's all we did all year was block him on short yardage or goal line. He, he the ball hit him in the helmet on that one. He didn't even, I think his hands weren't even close to the ball. The ball just was thrown and boom, 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 he dropped that ball. Uh, Eli went up to him at the end of practice, put his arm around him and said, David, you didn't have a very good practice, but I know I can count on you in the game. And he did it subtly. I could see what he was doing. He didn't make a big deal about it, but we went about our business. And it was one more thing. And no, I had no idea whether Plaxico would play or not. Plaxico played the whole year with a with a ligament damaged in his ankle where he couldn't practice. So he, then we get there and he he slips in the shower, I guess is what the story goes, and he hurt his knee. So we didn't know. I didn't have any idea. He didn't practice. He didn't go anywhere near the field. So I didn't know whether he was going to play or not. So what everyone forgets about the Super Bowl, everyone, no one even remembers that early in the fourth quarter, you guys have an 80-yard drive, and it ends with a pass to the back of the end zone to David Tyree. And I think everybody was just shocked that David Tyree caught a touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. Tell me about that play. That, that play put you ahead at the time, 10-7, to 7. But tell me about that play. Was he primary on that play? Oh, yeah, he was. He was the guy that was the indicator for the Patriots that it was run. It was going to be a run. Yep. So when we insert David Tyree into the game in the goal line, he's a blocker. So you can still see him coming down in motion, okay? We stayed with three wides, but he was the receiver to the side of the tight end. So here he comes down, and they're thinking – our primary play over there was a power play out of a one back look where the left guard pulled, you know, the whole deal. We pulled Richie, you know, Richie Seibert was our left guard. He pulled, it all looked like run. We fire off the ball, boom, boom, boom. Tyree comes down to block the first defender off the ball to the outside. Boom. He comes down, sticks his head in there and then he slips him. Eli makes the fake. He comes up and he fires. The backside safety is really close. If you remember, here he comes. He's he's so the margin of catching the ball is just very small. It's a little teeny window. David flips his hands up and catches it like he'd been doing it all his life and had practiced like a superhuman on Friday and whatever. And we that's our score. <laughs> that's our score. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we take the lead with that. And then they come, as you yep, know, you took boom, here they come. Yeah, they come back. Uh, Randy Moss uh, catches a touchdown pass. And now you've got the ball with 242 left in the fourth quarter. You're down. It's only the biggest game you've ever coached in your life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, as that series is going on, what's your, what's your thought about what you can do to try to get the ball in the end zone about the, against these guys, against this excellent defense? 
Well, I, we had had success, although it wasn't a lot, with different types of plays. You remember you hit Kevin Boss on the on the play action flag route for the biggest play of the game. Yeah. You know, Steve Smith has made a great contribution throughout the course of the game. You know, Plaxico didn't have much, but he controlled that other side of the field where they had two people, you know, for him every time. Amani had made had made plays uh, to get us in that spot. So we we still felt like, you know, we couldn't we couldn't just run the ball. Obviously, we weren't going to end up with enough time, but we felt that we could throw the ball and we could make plays. And this was our chance. And it was the it was the Strahan, Strahan story from the sideline. Remember, Strahan went to the offensive lineman. One drive to be world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. I mean, that's his exact quote. So when they came on the field, you know, we had – throughout the course, you have to remember, Peter, the Fox experts, no one picked us to win any game in that whole drive to the Super Bowl. Not Tampa, not Dallas, not Green Bay, and certainly not the Patriots. No game of any of those people, and we were it was a Fox game, no game was picked for us to win. We had been against all odds the entire time. Dallas beat us twice, we beat them. Green Bay, you know, minus 24 degrees. Plaxico and Eli looked like it was 75. Ball was flying all over the field. He, <laughs> he was making plays all over the place. So we had the belief in ourselves, okay? And then comes the play, third and seven. You know, ball is snapped. You've got Eli's being harassed or grabbed by three different defenders on all three sides. And he's almost right where, right in front of me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know? And, and one of the things he's that – He's going to get sacked. Did, he's going to get sacked. But but one of the things that I'm thinking that I I, I, I can't get past is – that I, I thought that uh, Mike uh, Michael Carey, the, the official, was 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 going to blow the play dead. I was worried that he was going to yeah. blow the play dead. And thank God, Eli wiggled enough to show some body movement that he didn't think he was under control and was going down. And then you see Eli shoot up. You see David going to the post and he comes back. Okay, and then you see. The ball in the air, and you're going, oh my God, don't don't throw an air ball down the middle of the field because that's going to be picked, and that's the story of the game. David Tyree comes back to the ball. He's got one of the greatest safeties in the game on him, who weighs more than, you know, probably 20 pounds more than than uh than David Tyree weighs. David. David yep. Tyree goes up in the air, Harrison right all over him. He catches the football pins it to the side of his hat. And what people really don't, they don't give enough credit for that catch because Rodney strips the his one of his hands away from his, you know, from holding the ball. Now he's got it in just one hand, okay? Now Harrison goes down be, on the back of his knees. You know playing in the backyard. Somebody goes across your knees. It, you, you're going to let the ball go. You're, you're just going to let the ball go because it's your, you know, you're thinking about the survival of your legs. He hangs on to the ball and makes one of the greatest catches in the history of the Super Bowl, if not the greatest catch. All right. And it's no fluke. That's the greatest that. catch in the history of the Super Bowl. <laughs> it is. It's not a question. Yeah. It is. And, you know, now we're, you know, I take a timeout because we're going to, you know, the whole thing that follows. Great play by a kid who I remember, you know, the other thing is David Tyree lost his mother during the season. And you, I don't know if you remember this, two games he missed. A Saturday night, right? A Saturday night. In a meeting, we come out of, they had to get him out of the meeting. Then when I came out of the meeting, there he is over in the corner with trying to be consoled. He's, he's out of control. And he and his mother were so tight. So tight. They had become born again together. They had and use drugs together, you know? So to David Tyree, this was an incredible blow. But he overcame that as well. You know, Tom, one of the most incredible little factoids that I bet everyone who listens to this, their jaw will drop 
some will know, but not many. That helmet catch is the last ball that David Tyree caught in his NFL career. It is. He never caught another ball. And, no. you know, it, and look, you want to go out on top, that is going That's out on way. top yeah. right there, yeah. you know? Yes, it but is. I always, I, I really always thought that was so, what was so interesting about that is after that play, there was such an emotional wave in that stadium, you know, in that game. Nobody could believe what they had just seen. But there's a minute left in the game now, and you still yeah. have to beat the almighty Patriots. That's so, right. I mean, you know, you've got a, exactly the emotion the of that moment. You almost have to say, hey, forget that. Okay, we made the play. Now we're at the whatever, the... 24 25 yard line and we got to get the last 25 yards hey, so we still score what do you remember right down right down the stretch and about what you wanted to what you guys wanted to call and what your thoughts were about what would work well we we we, we fast forwarded to something that had been good for us throughout the course of the day which was uh, the little ball to to uh, steve smith so that yeah. was our thinking was that we could move the ball. And we also were aware of the fact that what really happened on the touchdown play was going to come event eventually. And when we left the huddle on that play, Eli said to Plaxico, if they come with a blitz and leave you one-on-one -on -one out there, I'm coming to you. So Plax knew it. They both went out over the ball. And as they looked at it, you could see how it was developing and how it was, where it was going to come from. And of course the blitz came from the right side. OK, and you remember Brandon Jacobs sliding over there, picking it up. Eli had time. And when Plax made that fake, that the, the, the slant fake and then came out, Hobbs kind of sat down thinking he'd have to drive on the slant. And then Plaxico went up and Plaxico was wide open, you know, got behind him. Eli threw it up in the air. And I, from where I'm standing, I'm going, is that ball ever coming down? You know, because it was up, 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 up. <laughs> and Eli... And, and Plaxico turned around and he caught the ball like this, you know, like this in his chest. Plax, don't drop this ball. You know, sometimes you're mesmerized. You're so open. Here it comes. But that was, that was the story. And it wasn't over. It was 35 seconds left for, for, for the greatest quarterback of all time. And he fired two rockets down the hash that we thank God to Moss that we were able to defend. And so we Tom, you had a long him. life in foot. <laughs> I was just going to say, no. Jay Alford knocked Brady ahead, on his say butt it. too. He knocked Brady on yeah. his butt. And that shows you Brady. Brady got up, shook himself off, and in that last throw, you remember they rolled him to the right to buy more time so he could throw it further downfield. My lord, wow. he's throwing the ball sixty yards in the air. Tom, you had a long life in football. It's been basically your whole, you know, oh, yeah. adolescent and adult life, you know, Absolutely. until the last few years. Where does this game rank in your football experiences in your life? The, the one thing you have to understand, Peter, is that when you get to the top of the mountain and my my speech to my team on Saturday night before the Super Bowl is why I really wanted them to win is because when you win, everybody who helped you along the way is a world champion. And you share that mom and dad, wife, children, brothers and sisters, siblings, coaches that helped you along the way. Everybody's a world champion. And it's a wonderful feeling to be able to extend your arms around all of those who love you and have been there to support you and are with you at the top of the mountain. So that makes Super Bowl 42 for me, you know, a, a wonderful feeling. And, and along the way, Peter, there's, there's a ton of, you know, in 93, when I was at Boston college and we beat Notre Dame, that was number one out there, 41, 39. In 96, when we make the playoffs with an eight and eight record in Jacksonville, and we beat Denver and beat Elway out there. They, if, if we don't beat them, they win three in a row out there. 
you know, uh, when, in 90, when we beat uh, San Francisco, the game you're referring to out in, uh, out in San Francisco with, you know, all, all the great 15 to 13 goals, with five field goals, with the field goals, you know, all of those are, are, you know, when I was at Boston or when I was at RIT as the head coach and we tied Hobart college, who was the number one rushing team in division three after they'd beaten us like 54 <laughs> to seven the year before. And we tied them 14 all, you know, there's a bunch of games. Uh, Tom, over the years, over the last 15 years, have you ever had occasion at whatever event you might have been at together to have a conversation with Bill Belichick about this game? No, never. It's never, it's never come up. Now, Bill, after the game was over, you remember this. He, he caught some fire for this. The game wasn't even over. He came across the field. He came across to my sideline. He was he was like five feet from my sideline, and he was extremely gracious. I mean, I, I I can't tell you how nice. I don't know what other word to use. How nice he was to me personally, you know, because of all that we have had in the past uh, in terms of being both giant coaches in '90. I wasn't there in '86, but I was there in '90. And so for him to come over to acknowledge, put his arms around me, say in my ear, I'm not going to tell you what he said, but he said something, you know, which I'll never forget what he said, but he was extremely gracious. And he, he was the same way after Super Bowl 46. And, 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 and I, you know, uh, I'll never forget the greatest coach of all time, the greatest defensive coach of all time, wherever you want to put the moniker, okay? Because when when I – I'm not going to go there. But anyway, that was that was a, a, an incredibly moving moment for me. You know, I guess that when you're a competitor – you know, I once asked John Elway after he signed Peyton Manning and everybody wanted to know, boy, what made the decision for Peyton? And I remember I was alone with Elway and I said, I want to know, what did Manning say when you asked him, why'd you choose us? And he looked at me and he goes, I never asked him. And I go, you never asked him? And he goes, no, I never asked him. I figure... If he wanted to tell me that's his business, but you know, that's his decision. If he wants to share it, he'll share it. And I always felt like, you know, it's nosy people like me who want to know, <laughs> Hey, what did Belichick say to you? Or, or, yeah. you know, over the years, let's yeah. hear about the big conversation you had, but it's probably not. I mean, who knows? Maybe you'll be on the steps of Canton together one day and you'll finally have a conversation or something, but it, 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 well, he's going to be, so, there. it's gotta be, it's gotta be so painful for him. I would think, you know, him being such a student of history and having lost that game, it's gotta be painful for him, which, which, you know, you telling me the story now of how magnanimous Belichick was yeah. after that game. That's a check mark in his favor right there. And he was. And uh and I'll I'll never, you know, anytime I've ever seen, you know, we were we had the Canton game one time and he came through and he, he's <clears throat> I don't we don't pick up the phone and call each other. It's I've never been one of those. I've never been the phone coach. And all the years you're competing against yeah. people you don't. But uh, but obviously I have great respect for him and great great memories of when when we were both in New York and how we worked together. He had the secondary, I had the receivers, and we worked all the time together. We drove Parcells nuts. <laughs> we did. Hey, I I, I I'm I, I got to go. Listen, we've gone on far too long, but I've just I've enjoyed it. I can't. But but. But Tom, I got I got one other I got one other question about the 1990 game. 
you know, yeah, where sure. you beat Buffalo and and the kick is wide minutes. right and all that stuff. Yeah. But there's a couple of plays in that game with Mark Ingram that yeah. after the game, I remember talking to you after that game and that Jeff Hostetler, a couple of throws to Mark Ingram. When you look back on that, I don't think you win that Super Bowl without the plays that Mark, that Jeff Hostetler and Mark Ingram made. I told Mark, I told Mark after the game that that was the greatest play. It was was it third and eleven? He made twelve yards. Yeah. On a play over the middle, he he broke five tackles, five tackles to get the first down. And I told him after the game, Mark, that's the greatest non-scoring play to this point in the history of the Super Bowls. And I believed it. I believed it. If you were there and saw that play, there's no yeah. way that guy is going to get 12 yards. There's no way. Yeah. And then Stephen Baker up in the yeah. corner of the end zone, catching the flag route for a touchdown, you know, yeah. and us holding the ball for the touchdown minutes. maker, the defense, <laughs> the defense, the defense. I know you possess the ball for 41 minutes against the great 41 bills. Minutes. 41 minutes. And, and, but the firepower of that, that team, Jim Kelly and those, they're, you know, they're all in the Hall of Fame, for God's sake. The firepower yeah. of that team is incredible, you know. I'll always think that Marv Levy should have called one more play with eight seconds left, but that's a story <laughs> for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, it is. Tom Coughlin, it is. Um, I really appreciate you taking all the time. I've only monopolized your life uh, far too long uh, and much longer than I said I would. Uh, but I wish you the best with your book, Tom Coughlin, written with Greg Hanlon, a giant win inside the New York Giants historic upset over the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 42. Everybody who loves the Giants around the world, you now know what to get for your significant Giant fan for a holiday gift. Tom Coughlin, thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. My thanks to Tom Coughlin for joining me here on the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. I'll be writing about him in my column this coming week um, and some stuff from that conversation. But boy, I'll tell you, you know, he was the witness to a lot of great things in recent NFL history. And I love how he talks about that he's never had a conversation with Bill Belichick about that game, um, which... Kind of, you know, the old saying, the rules about Fight Club is that you don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> right. You know, the rules about coaching a big game and rubbing a great rival's coach, uh, rub it, rubbing his nose in the loss is that when you get together, you don't talk about them. You don't talk about that great game. So, you know, I appreciate, <laughs> uh, you know, the stories from Tom Coughlin. That was cool. So... This part two of the podcast, we're going to get into a lightning round. I've got my little stopwatch right here on my phone. And we are going to use the stopwatch. Miles and I are going to discuss six topics after this. And then we're going to have a double lightning round because I want to spend just a little bit more time. We'll spend two minutes on Deion Sanders because I, it's such an interesting topic. So... Uh, our topics for the lightning round will be the MVP discussion, the Bengals and Joe Burrow, the badness of both South divisions, Detroit being favored over 10 and two Minnesota. I'm going to ask Miles to give me 51 seconds on how he'd fix the Rams. And then we're going to discuss Deion Sanders to Colorado. All right, Miles, you ready to go? Let's do it. Okay. All right, lightning round. MVP, I've got Mahomes and Hurts very, very close with Joe Burrow breathing down their necks. Give me your pick and why. I'd say Jalen Hurts for this week with the caveat that knowing Mahomes' schedule over the last few weeks, 
I think that he might separate himself, but it's just the way that Philadelphia's offense is so adaptable. I mean, one week we see them run for the most yards that they've had since 1948. And then the next you see Jalen Hurts throw the ball all over the place to Devontae Smith and AJ Brown. So this week I'd say Jalen Hurts, but I know that that's going to change. The final thing I would say is watch out for Josh Allen. He's got some big games down the stretch. He's had a little bit of a trough in his season, but we will see. Eh, end of the first round. Number two, Bengals, Joe Burrow. So, Miles, I did not see this game. But the one thing I would say about the Bengals now is that in this calendar year, they're 5-0 and against the team that was the one seed last year and the team that entered this year, this weekend, as the one seed in the AFC. 3-0 and against Kansas City, 2-0 and against the Tennessee Titans. How dangerous are these Bengals? Very dangerous, and they're playing with a lot of confidence, and they should be playing with that much confidence. I mean, you know, we can talk about uh, Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes as MVP candidates, but I think you're right that Joe Burrow is breathing down their necks. They're getting healthier. Joe Mixon may be back this week, and that second-to-last week of the season – where they're going to play the Buffalo Bills in Cincinnati on Monday night. That's going to be a huge game. Uh, okay. The trouble of the two Souths. Ugh. Tennessee Fire has lost into the three sun. out of four. Yeah, Tennessee has lost three out of four. There's nobody else in that division. But I think the one thing I would say that would worry me about Tennessee, this team's averaging 18 points a game. Mm -hmm. How in the world are you going to be able to win enough? You can't ask your defense every game against really good offenses in January. You can't ask them to hold teams to 10 and 13 points. They, they have got to accelerate the learning curve of Traylon Burks right now. Hope he's not hurt after the huge shot he took on Sunday in Philadelphia, but I don't think that route was a fluke in Philly. Tell me about the Souths and in particular your thought on the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, I, the problem with the Tennessee Titans is that they're not getting Derrick Henry to the second level of defenses in the last couple of weeks. They couldn't do it against Cincinnati. They really couldn't do it against Philadelphia either. And if that happens, then that gives teams the opportunity to build a lead against that team. And it's really, really hard for the Titans to come back from behind just because they're not built for that. And there's only so much you can do when you don't have a good enough receiving core. So I think you're right. Is it, hopefully, uh, That's the okay. end of that. Okay. <laughs> Detroit Enough. favored by one point over the Minnesota Vikings. Now, the game is in Detroit. And who knows? The line will probably change three times before Sunday. That right. is startling to me. But you look at the way the Lions are playing, especially Jared Goff. Miles kind of looks like the keeper now. It looks like yeah. the Lions are not going to have to use that Ram pick to go get a quarterback, but we'll see. But Amon Ross St. Brown has been great, and they're 4-1 and one in their last five. Does this line shock you, or is it justified? I think it's a little surprising, but not shocking. Look, that offense has been as good as any offense in the league. If you look at it over the course of what it's done all season, two defenses that are not very good. I think it's interesting that Dan Campbell was saying, this is why you get into coaching this kind of week. They're trying, he's making it as big as it is, as opposed to coaches who try not to make it bigger than what it is. So it is a big game and we'll see if Detroit's for real. And. I gave you six extra seconds. Okay, Miles, I'm going to give you the next 51 seconds to tell me how you would fix the three and nine Los Angeles Rams. Okay, this is something that's off the wall, and by the time this comes out, it's going to be irrelevant. But I would claim Baker Mayfield and see what he can do over the last four weeks of the season because you don't know what's going to happen with Matthew Stafford next year. Spinal contusion and you know being in and out of the concussion protocol, it's something that I think could affect the way Matthew Stafford makes decisions going forward. So you need to figure out what you're going to do at the quarterback position. And then you're going to have to flip 
your second and third round picks into more picks. Fortunately, they are at the top of the round, or they're going to be at the top of the round in the second and third round. You're going to be able to flip those things, hopefully for more picks, and get as many shots at the dartboard as possible, and then also fix the offensive line like the Cincinnati Bengals did last year and like the Kansas City Chiefs did the year before. Total overhaul there. Excellent points. All right, Miles. We've gone five minutes on those five topics. We're going to go a little bit longer on this topic, and I'm really interested because I I didn't really think of Deion Sanders to Colorado as controversial. But I think many people in the media and some people in the public really do. As people know about what Deion Sanders has been doing, he's been the coach at Jackson State for three years. Uh, he just had the, I think I'm right in saying, the first undefeated season in Jackson State history. And they've had some pretty glorious seasons, uh, you know, at that mid-level of Division I AA or whatever, again, whatever it's called. But, uh, you know, he's really turned the program around. He's made it exciting to be a Jackson State Tigers fan. And I think as far as the people who love HBCUs, and historically black college football, he has made it very, very relevant and kind of cool to be an HBCU fan. So I've noticed in the last two or three days since he got this job on Sunday that there's a lot of people who are angry about it, some of whom believe that Deion Sanders should stay at an HBCU school because he is helping revive the prospects of some of these programs. And there are others who say, you would leave. Okay, we understand that. But Colorado? I mean, is that the program you want to leave for? Is on the bottom of the Pac-12 and, and blah, blah, blah. So I want to hear your thoughts about, and again, I'm going a lot on Twitter and a lot on kind of wild opinions of people who believe that, okay, I understand Dion going, but to Colorado and, you know, there's also some sentiment he's abandoning the HBCUs. So what's your thought about Dion going to Colorado? Well, there's a part of me that that does understand the disappointment uh, that people may feel um, in terms of Dion Sanders leaving Jackson State. But I, I personally, I have a hard time with kind of putting somebody down for what their ambitions are. And, you know, if you want to go and coach in the Pac-12, that's something that you should be able to do. It's what college coaches do. And so I, I, I sort of see it from both sides, I guess, in that way. And, you know, you can look at it in the sense of, okay, yeah, Deion Sanders was trying to and sort of sold this as I, I'm going to revive things at HBCUs. I'm going to show that we can do this here. And in some ways, that legacy is still there. There are things that are still set up for Jackson State to succeed. However, the resources that you get from going to from Jackson State to Colorado in just the sense of how much are the assistant coaches paid? I, I just looking at it in that way, the resources are so, so, so much more at Colorado than they are at Jackson state. And I don't mean that in a way that's putting anybody down. It's just objective reality, right? So I get it from that standpoint. And, you know, you can say that Colorado is not the best job in the PAC 12. It's probably not, but when you take UCLA and USC out of the PAC 12, as they are about to be, you know, and they're going to the big 10, I think it really changes the dynamic of what that conference is and what it can be. And we don't know just what is going to happen there when you put somebody like Deion right. Sanders in charge. I mean, it could really change the fortunes of what Colorado is. And so for all of those reasons, I, I totally understand why Deion Sanders is doing what he's doing. And I think that it makes Colorado one of the most interesting college football programs to watch over the next couple of years, because I don't, I don't know exactly what they're going to do to measure success at Colorado, you know, in terms of what it's been and what it could be and who Deion Sanders is and all that. But it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. Do you think going to Colorado is ultimately beneficial for other black coaches? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. Um, maybe the ones that are on his staff because they're associated with him. And if they turn that program into a successful program, then you would think that they're going to get more opportunities elsewhere. Um, but you know, it, it's almost like NFL ownership where they have to be comfortable with who it is that they're hiring in the yeah. first place. And that, doesn't necessarily, I mean, just one being successful or having successful coaches on your staff doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else is going to do it. I mean, this is kind of the conversation we were having about Jerry Jones last week, right? I mean, it, it's, he says it's who, you know, and that's sort of saying the quiet part out loud. And so when you have these systemic yeah. hiring practices, it's not going to change based on just one person. So, I mean, uh, you'd like to think so, but uh, in reality, I, I, I kind of don't. I think I think the whole thing is really interesting because obviously I'm about as white a person as there is and I grew up in white bread America. I went to college at Ohio University which is you know predominantly a white school. Um and you know so I don't know and look I've worked in this business for a long time for 42 years. But I don't know really, and it's hard for me to judge the those who say that Deion Sanders, uh, that this is an act of betrayal. I just I find it very hard to believe that in the United States of America, when a person is going to better himself and is going to better the lives of apparently of quite a few people who work with him on his coaching staff and who knows the other support people. I don't, I have no idea how college football works and whether you take X number of people with you. I don't know that, but I do think that people need to step back, take a deep breath and understand that this is Deion Sanders life. You know, he, he, he doesn't have to just because you think he should, he doesn't have to, stay at coaching at a program for whatever reason it would be for any length of time. He's free to go. And rather than think Deion Sanders is a traitor, um, you know, to the, to whoever, you know, to, to other black people, to black players, black, whatever it is, I, the way I look at it is, look, he did great things at Jackson state, great things. He never promised anybody that he was going to stay there for 20 years or that he was going to become the Eddie Robinson, uh, Eddie Robinson, the second of black college football. He didn't do that. I mean, let's just let's be happy for a guy who uh, worked his rear end off and did a great job at that school and now is probably going to shake up the balance of power at some level of the, maybe not at the Alabama and and Georgia and Clemson level of college football, but maybe that next step down. And you know, Miles, I just have this strong feeling. I think within two years, Colorado's gonna be in the top 10. I just do. I don't know if they're ever gonna be in the top four or whatever this playoff system is going to be, but I think Deion Sanders is gonna really shake things up in division one football. And I look, I'm not a big college football watcher at all, but I'm really going to be interested in this and I'm going to be watching a lot of it. And I might even read those re idiotic recruiting stories that said, I wonder what, what, what number class Colorado is going to have on rivals.com this year or something. Yeah. But and I just think it's interesting. And I think we ought to, if this is the United States of America, we ought to let a man do what he wants to do. And good for, I say good for Dion. Yeah. You know, that's interesting, Peter. Cause I mean, I grew up going to PWIs, predominantly white institutions too. I mean, I was at private school in suburban Cleveland, Ohio. I went to Columbia university. So that's what my background is. And it, it is not the HBCU background. And so I, I can't speak from that particular experience. So my my view on it, I think, is skewed in part by that and also in part by the fact that, you know, I have put myself first in my career and done things that, you know, maybe some people would think like, how, why are you doing that for? And it's like, well, that's 
just what I want to do. And so that's why for me, it's hard to be like, well, why, why is it that this person should stay in one place, you know, and not do the things that all college football coaches do, you know, you are at one place and then you, you are successful, a smaller institution, and then you continue to move up. But I think by that same token, that, that's why I don't have the perspective of, man, you know, this is, this is disappointing. I, I, I'll put it this way. I can understand more the disappointment in Deion Sanders leaving than the anger, right? And I think that those are two different emotions. And you can sometimes feel disappointed that something didn't last longer, whereas you can understand why it is or versus being angry with somebody for doing what they want to do and trying to right. improve the lives of their assistants, you know? That those things to me are, are two different things. And I, I hope that people can kind of separate those emotions and, and, and feel that in that way. So that's our podcast for this week. We had some fun. We took on a couple of topics. We had Tom Coughlin. He was fun. And uh, I believe that in the next couple of weeks, um, I've had a lot of writers on and a lot of book people on. I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to try to get back to actual, you know, current people in the game. And and I love my conversations uh, with authors, with, you know, and with, you know, with people who might have been out of the game for a while. But we'll try to hit some more current people in the next few weeks. I am going to sign off now with my friend, Miles Simmons. The Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. Thanks for experiencing it this week, either on video here or just listening. And again, we've gone way too long. One final note, last week I said, if you made it to the end and you listened to the entire podcast, I'm going to give you a free lifetime subscription to the thing. 17 people wrote to me at peterkingfmia at gmail.com and said, okay, I'm signing up for my free subscription <laughs> or, or some words like that. Um, it's kind of just a joke. Podcasts are free. You get them anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I really appreciate people who listen to, I think it was like an hour 49 last week. I hope we're a little bit shorter this week, but it's probably not much. Anyway, thanks for listening to the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. We'll be back next week. In the immortal words of Mike Greenberg, we'll be back and better than ever. Thanks a lot, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.